I'm Sarah Brumfield. Um, I'm one of the volunteers here, and I was a person in the back of the room uh, yesterday who was you know, expressing my opinion on how you could get more women at conferences <laughs> like this. And it actually generated a lot of interest in side conversations, so I thought I might do a lightning talk on it. Um, in addition to having a, a degree in computer science, uh, my undergrad work, I had a second major in the study of women and gender. So this is actually something that's very near and dear to my heart for reasons beyond just being a woman but the navel-gazing, why am I the only woman here part of it as well. So I've done a lot of research in the theory behind it. And what I wanted to do is give you two terms that are useful, because I find when you start naming things, it kind of gives them power and you can think about things in different ways. Uh, the first one is called imposter syndrome. And it's a, one of the theories on why you don't have a lot of women at a conference like this, is that they feel like imposters. Um, and so, uh, you can kind of get this if you've ever like raised your hand and somebody asked a question, and, oh, how many of you have done X? And you raise your hand and you're like, well, maybe you sort of I've done X or I've tried to do X or yeah, that last three slides I totally got lost on. You don't feel like, you know, you're there, but you're sort of faking it. And that feeling is something that a lot of people who are uh, underrepresented in groups um, can feel. And they don't realize that everyone else in the group 50% of them probably feel the same way. They assume it's because they are imposters, that they don't belong. So uh, in a, uh, a story on this, when I was an undergrad, the first couple of programming classes we took, there was always that one guy in the front row who asked the really obnoxious, hard questions. And I was lucky enough to have uh, friends and to be able to identify that as this really obnoxious thing that people do. We actually, um, Ben in the back of the room, who I ended up marrying, gave it a name, the Voice of Unquestionable Authority, which once you named it, you could be like, yeah, he's just VOUA. Um, and even better, the biggest culprit in my uh, classes, I ended up uh, lobbying and grading two years later for a class he was taking, and yeah, he didn't have any clue what he was talking about. So that was really useful to find out, because it took me two years. Um, and you have to kind of stick with it. And one thing that was suggested is, oh, what can you do about it, or is it your fault? Um, I don't think it's your fault unless you're putting bikini-clad women on, on slides, and I'm assuming most of you aren't doing that. But one thing that you, the sort of things that you can do about it are things that kind of cut down on that imposter syndrome feeling. So uh, we at LSRC always have women's teachers, and I love that, and I suspect that I'm part of the reason we do that, because I've always been here. <laughs> but it's something that makes you feel very welcome. And it's a token, but it's a nice token that kind of gets you a step beyond the yes and the law here. Um, if you find yourself using things like the VOUA, try not to. Um, instead, try bringing the problems that you're trying to solve to the table to discussions. Because problems show humility, but they also, it's cool because you bring your humility in and you actually might get answers. So it's kind of a, if you can take that and become comfortable enough to bring your problems in, it's a, a cool way to, to work on the imposter problem. Um, also, just be welcoming, be nice, try to explain things if people don't, don't get it, but you get all that. Now, the problem with that is, in order for you to do that, people have to show up, and there's not that many of us here, right? And so this brings me to my second concept, which we call the pipeline problem. And the idea with the pipeline problem is, you know, to get to a place like LSRC, there's a series of decisions that got you here. And you start out with 50% of the population, and at age 12, you decide you don't like math. Boom, you're down to 10% of uh, the population. And then in high school, you decide not to take calculus. Boom, you're down to like 5% of the population. You get in that first programming class, because maybe you're interested in it, and you know you drop out after a week because it's really hard, and you feel like you're an imposter. <laughs> and so every stage of this game, is that this pipeline gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and that just means you get here, and there's only 12% of you, which is actually really high. That's about, to in the 10% or what I was seeing in like undergraduate computer science programs in the late 90s. Um, we've been working on the pipeline problem for years. Like, me personally, about 16, you know, you go, you mentor, you give presentations, you encourage girls, you tell them how cool it is, all of that stuff, it's not working. So, I don't know, I can tell you, I can define this term and tell you that's what we've been trying to do, but it doesn't work. Um, so, what do you do about that? I don't know, I have a couple of, of ideas. One of them is to look at what we could call a second pipeline which is grown-ups, people who are figuring out who they are, because gender is a big component of figuring out who you are, at the same time they're making career decisions. 
Um, so if you can go find women, so um, I have a lot of acquaintances who are librarians. Um, a lot of librarians these days are picking up programming, some of them even Ruby. Um, they're doing it because they have a lot of data that they want to deal with, a lot of textual analysis that they want to do because their work is very much online. Set time up for one minute. One minute. Okay. Um, I also, I work for a very, very large corporation. There's tons of women around. They're not in developer roles. They're in tester roles. They're in support roles. They are technical women. They probably are smart enough, technical enough to pick up programming. You just have to figure out how to transfer them there. And I think they're old enough that they put them, they've gotten, they've worked themselves into this. They've learned everything they've done on their own. So you could combine that with some classes, introductory stuff that, hey, yeah, you could do this if you wanted to. I think you might actually be able to expand that pipeline some more. If you were in uh, Dana's presentation yesterday, she actually came to Ruby after being uh, an AA who munged a lot of data from reports. And this is, this is a the part of the pipeline I hadn't even thought about. But she's like, yeah, there's tons of women out there who are dealing with data and coming up with ways to write scripts in Excel. They have the right mindset. They have the right skill set. If you could just take them under your wing somehow and convince them that, yes, they could do this. Um, and my, I'll leave you with my final point, which is the point I made at the back of the room the other day, which is the people you have the most influence on are your daughters and perhaps your wives. Because there's a lot of us here who maybe started out as programmers and then got married to somebody who happens to also be here. But there's a lot of us here, I've noticed, who are here because their husbands have brought them along and taught them and convinced them.